No either. Start my timer so that I don't meander too much. I'm a career in the National Park Service affords you know, some a public historian an opportunity to you know, literally put the the tray up to the smorgasbord of American history and you know, take one and keep moving down. And th if there's a through line in my career, it's sites that involve you know, controversy or tragedy. And you know, when in leaving. You know, in contemplating leaving Andersonville, in, when I was interviewed for my net current position, I was you know, typical Park Service interview question: Why do you want to work at this park? What makes you think you're the right person for it? And this this am answer is both truthful and really flip. And it, it was this: After four and a half years of working at the deadliest place on American soil, what's left but Armageddon? <laughs> And, you know, and and so having the day to myself, you know, here in Chicago, you know, going back to my own, uh, my graduate degree days, if I can do a shameless plug for a book, Kenneth Foote's Shadowed Ground is, is a fabulous work that talks about how American society deals with sites of tragedy, controversy, violence. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the, you know, the site of the Eastland disaster mm -hmm. the, and out to the Fort Dearborn Memorial, and because I'd seen those pictures and I've read about them, I'd never been there before, and that was the, part of the highlight of my day, beyond, of course, being here, here this evening. We're going to meander in and out of the prisoner of war story. I, I know from personal experience you cannot talk about Andersonville without talking about other Civil War prisons, and you cannot talk about Civil War prisons without talking about Andersonville. They are separate things but they are you know, very much intertwined. The story of Civil War, Prisoners of War, is a thread that runs through the entirety of the conflict, affecting tens of thousands of men and communities across the country, north and south. The experience of Prisoners of War is often absent from traditional narratives of the Civil War. This evening, we'll explore and discuss you know, this story through examining a few of the significant people, places, legal trends that connect military prisons and prisoners of war to the larger issues of the war and its consequence. And there's a little bit of anniversary you know, appropriateness here. It was you know, true yet 150 years ago yesterday was the anniversary of the arrest of Henry Wirtz. And in two days is the 150th anniversary of the arrest of Jefferson Davis. And, and those things, again, are separate, but they are intertwined. Prisoner of War will be the first to tell you that a war never ends easily. By May of 1865, USPOWs had been streaming home for months as exchanges had resumed early that year. Men who'd been counted among the missing for a year or more <coughs> were reunited with their families. And yet, in 1865, the captivity experience closes exactly like the war does, with ragged edges. In late April, a steamboat boiler explosion of, you know, on the Sultana on an April evening on the Mississippi River leads to the single greatest maritime disaster in American history, over 1,200 dead. Men who had survived Andersonville and the Cahaba prison burned to death and drown in, in the, that dark Mississippi night. Survivors of both Civil War Southern prisons and then Sultana, in their memoirs, many of them spend more time talking about this one night on the Mississippi than they do the six months previous in Andersonville. So their captivity became a lesser trial compared to that particular experience. On May 7th, 1865, it was a warm, sultry spring morning in, at Camp Sumter. The prison had been becoming unwound for over a month. The last prisoners to depart for an exchange left on the 20th of April, 
bound for Jacksonville, Florida. The entire time they're being moved south, some of them think they're going to be murdered. It isn't until they cross the defense line into Jacksonville and are you know, greeted, you know, a USCT regiment brings out their band for these dirty, starving kids. By early May, you know, Georgia is coming under the control of the Federal Army and military occupation is, a, is, is starting to settle in. A, in the opening days of May, a U.S. captain had passed through on the train, you know, the train idled through Anderson Station, and he witnessed Henry Wirtz berating prisoners, and swearing at them, if you do not sign this paper, you are not free. One more example that Henry Wirtz dis you know, disregarded the laws of war you. You know, as just part of everything he did. On the morning of the 7th, Captain Noyes and a small party under the orders of General Wilson, you know, they'd spent the night in America's Georgia. They arrive at Andersonville where the, the colonel commanding the entire camp had fled to Florida several weeks earlier. <laughs> Most of the guard regiments are gone, but Henry Wirtz, you know, as a measure of the man, he may, may have been despicable, but he was still doing his job. He and a small portion of the medical staff were completing records. He's arrested on the morning of May 7th in front of his family and you know, escorted north where he will face an uncertain future. <coughs> what is the place that Henry Wirtz leaves behind at, at the time of his arrest? The, a place that he'd managed for 13 of his 14 operational months. The Camp Sumter military prison opens in early 1864 as the solution to a great problem facing the Confederacy. And that was the problem of the prisons in Richmond. Now, throughout the entire war, the Confederacy was centralizing prisoners into Richmond, and, and it worked fine until 1864. It was seen as a, as a threat to the civilian population, a military threat. They had to get them out. And, and set, rural southwest Georgia was the right place. When the first prisoners arrived beginning February 24th, 1864, these are men who'd been captured in 1863, held over winter at a tobacco warehouse or at Belle Isle. Camp Sumter is an improvement. The Macon newspaper has a, they have a reporter on the scene on February 24th, and prisoners are pleased with the change of venue. Their enthusiasm will not last for long. The prison is located in southwest Georgia precisely because of how far it is from where the war has been fought. That was a tactical choice made in set, you know, November of 1863. And this is a reminder that military planners are often you know, really poor fortune tellers. <laughs> the writing's on the wall. You know, Chickamauga had happened just a couple of months earlier. Sherman's not going anywhere. It's magical thinking. And yet they... They put this prison in remote Georgia, expecting, oh, no one's going to come anywhere near this. <laughs> the unexpected pressure of the Atlanta campaign puts unforeseen pressure on the prison's operation within just a couple of months. And then the Overland campaign puts a crushing burden upon the prison because the Confederacy is still centralizing all of their prisoners. They're sending them to one place, and that is beautiful. Sumter County, Georgia. A prison population of 33,000 by August of 1864 in a facility designed to hold 10,000 would test the brightest of you know, military leaders. Short-handed and short-supplied, the command structure of the prison struggles under this challenge, almost to a breaking point. What did been an unremarkable military prison in its first three months, is transformed into a place you know, unprecedented in American history. And again, it stands alone. You cannot talk about military prisons without talking about this one, but this one's different. 
it, it's the, the prison that defines and then defies every single rule during the course of the war. General John Winder, and who had sort of become the overseer of military prisons for the Confederacy by default as provost of Richmond, he incubates a cadre of men whose name appear over and over again in the management of military prisons for the Confederacy. He handpicks officers for, for Camp Sumter, including a son and a nephew. They're, they're not picked because they're experts in their field. They're picked because of family. Winder personally chooses the commandant for the, to actually run the prison proper as, as the feature of the, of the camp. Which raises, of course, you know, the obvious question, who is Henry Wirtz? He's one of the most misunderstood men of the Civil War. And for well over 100 years, there's been a you know, revision, revisionist campaign to turn this man into a victim. He's not. He is, if the Confederacy has an expert in military prison management, it, this is it. He's come to the, he comes to the attention of General Winder by September 1861. There's a, a new, Richmond newspaper piece that talks about a prison board that's been formulated to establish you know, and, and oversee the management of military prisons in Richmond. Half the names on that list are names that reoccur three years later at Andersonville, and chief among them is Sergeant Henry Burke. And Prison Memoirs from Richmond, published in 1862, you have great descriptions of the Dutch sergeant at Andersonville. He, prisoners would call him the Dutch captain, reflecting that change in rank. He's a Swiss immigrant. He immigrates to the United States in 1848. He works as a translator in New England in factory towns initially, then moves moves on to Kentucky, and it's in Kentucky that he, he enters the water cure business, you know, and that, that's the origin of this idea that he's a doctor. He's not a doctor, but he's involved in hydrotherapy, which was a very trendy line of you know, pseudoscience at the time. By 1857, he's moved from Kentucky further south to Louisiana, where he's the plantation overseer for the cabin teal plantation across the river from Vicksburg. It's there that Henry Wirtz learns how to manage people, control people. In 1862, he's assigned by General Winder on an inspection tour of military prisons of the Confederacy. So he goes to Camp Tyler, Texas. He, he commands the prison, of one of the prisons in Alabama for a short amount of time, and then he disappears. In 1863, he goes, to, goes back to Europe, and a lot is said about that time period. Most of it's not true, or at least not provable. Now, the, the mythology is he's on a secret mission. We can't prove that. He doesn't say that. In, in the interviews he does to reporters before his ex eventual execution, he, he doesn't say that he's on an assignment. He says he's on a furlough. He crosses the blockade in early 1864 back to, to the south, and it's immediately after that that he's, he's selected to, to manage operations at the new prison. In the absence of an adequate number of guards and other resources, Henry Wirtz manages by incubating a climate of intimidation, a theater of captivity, intended to scare prisoners, you know, cow them into submission. Those prisoners who attempt escape or violate their paroles are subjected to punishments that are straight out of plantation slavery. Iron collars, <coughs> balls and chains where 12 of you are connected to a 100-pound iron ball by your ankles, and then you're connected to each other by the neck. If you attempt escape, 
you're hunted down by dogs. And thus, Andersonville becomes a place where young U.S. soldiers experience the horrors of slavery firsthand. And some of these young men, they realize, wait, I'm, everything that they heard in Uncle Tom's Cabin is happening to them at Andersonville. And it's very effective. Escape is, during the height of the prison's operation, escape is essentially impossible. One, one prisoner in, in a small group of his fellows, if, you know, they break their parole from burial detail, and in 28 hours, they make 40 miles to the northwest before they're captured by the dogs. The dogs are very effective in stopping escape. When the war comes to an end and the prison comes to an end, the remote location of Andersonville is an impediment, but not very, not ultimately not a big one. The 13,000 American soldiers there demand that a national cemetery be created, and the Captain James Moore, who by the time he comes to Andersonville has established two national cemeteries in Virginia leads an expedition into Georgia that's famously accompanied by Clara Barton. It's important to note that Clara Barton takes some credit here for stuff that she does not do. Clara Barton did not establish a cemetery. The United States does. Clara Barton did not identify the graves. The U.S. Army does with using captured records and the, the work of a parole prisoner who'd copied the death register this expedition completes their work in August. And the important thing that Claire Barton does do is, is a reminder that sometimes what we intend to do in life is compounded with unintended consequences or opportunities. As a, as a Pacific Northwesterner, Lewis and Clark expedition is really important to me and you know, to my childhood. You know, Mary Weber Lewis is a personal hero. Famously, the Lewis and Clark expedition had one woman along with it. And that woman literally saved those men's lives. Indian tribes treated them decently because they had a woman. And ironically, at Andersonville, Clara Barton plays that same role as you know, Chicago Wea. She, as she is doing the work of the missing soldier's office and copying the names of the dead to help families find answers, she and the army are surprised that by flocks of freedmen seeking her out specifically to ask Miss Clara, what does it mean to be free? Miss Clara, my master says, President Lincoln is dead, is this true? Miss Clara, my master says, because President Lincoln is dead, I am not free, is this true? And that's the genesis of a very close relationship between the freedmen of southwest Georgia and the site of the prison, the, the very place where 13,000 men are buried for over half a century. After the war, Memorial Day at Andersonville, for the first couple of years, is a very lonely affair. It's certain Because if you're a white southerner, you hate this place. You hate it. It's an embarrassment to you. If you're a black southerner, you celebrate this place because those men died for you. And that's a remarkable thing. And it, and it really and often overlooked part of our story. Hard on the heels of the establishment of the National Cemetery and the completion of that work in mid-August, a military tribunal convenes in Washington City to try Henry Wirtz for violations of the law, laws of war. And this is the most famous, but not the only war crimes trial of the, the Civil War. Henry Wirtz is not the only person to be tried for violations of the laws of war at Andersonville. He's not the only military prison commander to be tried. He's not the first person to be hung. He's arguably the most famous out of at least three. In the course of three months, this military tribunal hears testimony from almost 150 witnesses. And these witnesses are Confederate and federal. 
They are officers and prisoners. They are civilians. And their testimony is, in many respects, the most overlooked part, you know, resource for, for Andersonville. Historians, you know, well, writers on Andersonville, you know, conforming to a confirmation bias, you know, skip over the resource material of the trial because it, it's very confounding. The Confederate officers who serve with Wirtz, who served under Winder, are, are very blunt about the dysfunction of the place. <coughs> They're absolutely truthful out of it, you know, damningly so. And on November 10th, 1865, Henry Wirtz is put to death for the violations of the laws of war. His execution is in many respects the sunset of military justice you know, as we come out of the war period. By early 1866, military tribunals come to an end, even though public sentiment and the Judge Advocate General's office want these trials to continue. The end of the military tribunals marked the beginning of a continued struggle to make sense of the 56,000 prisoner of war deaths during the course of the war. Survivors and their and victims' families hold the South responsible. And that's contrasted, of course, by how you know, once the military tribunals end, someone like Jefferson Davis is being imprisoned and treated perceived to be treated much better than, than captives, you know, ultimately under his care. The end of military tribunals was something that occurs courtesy president by, really by executive order through President Andrew Johnson. And when he, he, when he ends military tribunals, it's, it's remarkable in that the United States, we could have we kept trying people for treason, for war crimes, for years. Year, George Pickett could have been a war criminal. In a real sense, that would have been poking out our own eyes. When do you stop? And so Andrew Johnson commits this amazing act of forgiveness, and he's hated for it. Radical Republicans hate that. They, the Army is not entirely happy about not being able to keep trying people. For all of this. And so how does this start? What, how did we come to this? At the beginning of the war, both sides are expecting a, a, a very quick conflict. Little to no planning is made for, for prisoners of war, accommodating them or exchanging them. When it starts to happen, you're, you're operating off of military tra tradition, nothing that's been particularly codified. You have battlefield exchanges that are compounded and, and formalized in 1862 with the Dix Hill Cartel. And the Dix Hill Cartel really draws its language straight out of the cartel between the United States of America and England for the War of 1812. And the cartel establishes a very strict structure of equal exchange, you know, private for a private, corporal for a corporal, captain for a captain, and then... How many, how many privates equal a sergeant, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and that that system works for a whole another year, reasonably successfully. In 1863, you have the next evolution of this this story, filling a vacuum in codifying military tradition into actual structure. At the request of the Lincoln administration, a legal scholar, Francis Lieber, and, and Fr Francis Lieber has skin in the game. He has a son as an officer on either side. Lieber codifies a, the laws of war. This is the first time this is ever done. And the, the, the Lieber Code, or General Orders 100, is one of the most unsung documents of the war in terms of how important it is. It provides protections for civilians, protections for prisoners of war. It's, it represents, in many respects, the greatest American ideals. You can't enforce perfectly parts of this, but we're attempting to provide a limit to how war is fought, 
to limit the collateral damage in many respects. The Confederacy adopts most, but not all, of the Libra Code. The Libra Code is also a stealth moment in American history. One of its provisions for prisoners of war is, is essentially the first equal rights policy of the United States government. In terms of exchange, a black soldier is to be treated equally. No, 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 no equivocation, is to be treated equally. Confederacy disagrees, and, and this is what precipitates the great crisis that leads to Andersonville. Following the assault on Battery Wagner, 35 members of 54th Massachusetts are taken prisoner. They're not treated equally. They, they are put in the Charleston City Jail, and thereupon the Confederate command, you know, there is a Confederate policy. The Congre Confederate Congress has said, repatriate those men to, the, to their plantations, treat them as slaves, you know, execute the officers. Commanders in the field know that policy, but they're sort of, they're at a loss. What, what do we actually do now? And so they get put to the Charleston City Jail. The governor of South Carolina wants to try those soldiers as war criminals and execute them. He's held off by Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis understands that that would be perhaps too provocative an act. When the Lincoln administration learns of the fate of these 35, that they are not being treated equally, that they are not being exchanged, the exchange is demolished. It's, it's stopped. By August of 1863, exchange, regular exchanges fully cease. And this is a really important moment. For the first two years of the war, there were military prisons. They're not fabulous places, but they're not infamous places. Salisbury, North Carolina, in 1862, they are playing baseball. The end of the exchanges turns this sort of place into this sort of place. Both sides are bankrolling prisoners because they're not exchanging them. The United States has a capacity to absorb a whole lot more prisoners than the Confederacy does, and the Confederacy continues on this path of centralization. This is one of the famous riddle photographs taken on August 16, 1864. Your right here is the, this is the east wall of the prison. There's a guard tower. This is taken from a guard tower. The, the creek that flows through the prison is you know, off the frame in this direction. This is the north slope here. And right about the horizon line is where the prison had been expanded about two months earlier for 10 additional acres of space for a total of 26 and a half. These photographs, there are only 10 pictures taken of Andersonville during its operation. And we often look at them and then, you know, and, and, and then tune them out in many respects. And we were talking about this last night. The, there are details in these photographs that are quite remarkable. This area here is, is known as the island. It's on the edge of the floodplain where the creek passes through the prison. And that, you know, that creek becomes known as the swamp, and it is a swamp of excrement and oil and, you know, and trash. It's, it's horrible. The men who are camping down here, <laughs> They're pretty brave souls. In higher resolution versions of the photograph, and on this it's going to be hard to see, but right here are corn stalks. This is, being a prisoner, you know, it's not a happy story. It's a story, you know, in some respects of enforced victimhood, but visitors, and prisoners are sovereign. They have the ability to do certain things, and the cornmeal you're being given is so coarse that you can take whole, whole kernels and plant them. If you're planting corn and trying to raise corn next to your shelter, what does that say about your confinement? Do you think you're going anywhere? Yeah. No, you're, you're here to stay. It's also a remarkable investment in hope, because oh. you, 
You have to water that corn every day. You have to guard that corn. There are, in diaries, accounts of prisoners who essentially lost their mental acuity, going crazy and trying to steal people's corn. Mm -hmm. And and that's a real loss. If you you put all this time into trying to raise corn next to your shelter and someone destroys it, what does that do to you? One of the truisms of Andersonville, visitors to that particular site, is you know, a certain kind of visitor comes in and they go very sanctimoniously, well, prison, blah, 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 pick one. It's just as bad as Andersonville. It's the Andersonville of the North. No, it's not. It's a lie. Every time someone says that, a historian loses, the, loses her wings. <laughs> <laughs> You cannot, with a straight face, in any honesty, compare southern military prisons to northern military prisons. You can compare southern military prisons to southern military prisons and northern military prisons to each other, but it's apples and oranges. They are dramatically different operations in dramatically different cultures with dramatically different resources. The United States has the great blessing of a vast land base, of a massive military bureaucracy, which is also its downside in terms of planning. Where northern prisons go wrong is in contracting and supply, (laughs) almost always. The the blessing of of the federal prison system is if you have an incompetent commander, you can get rid of him. Southern prisons, again, you're concentrating, all the time concentrating. The, this map shows, and this is early summer 1864. These are military prisons with over a thousand prisoners. And you know, in the interest of full disclosure, there, there's one missing, and that would be way over here in San Francisco Harbor, Alcatraz Island. The U.S. military prison system, Key West, you know, Ship Island, all the way to Boston Harbor. Prisoners are being transferred as this facility is open and close. It's a massive system. And, and again, in the South, concentrate, concentrate, concentrate. Until the, the capture of Atlanta. The capture of Atlanta throws a massive wrench in the Confederate system. Because if, if Sherman can take Atlanta, you know, if you're sitting in... In, in Richmond, and you're in the Secretary of War's office, or, in, or you're in Jefferson Davis' office, if, if Sherman can take Atlanta, where's, where do you think he's going next? You're terrified out of your mind. He's going to liberate the men of Andersonville. And, and in September of 1864, there's 30,000 men in Andersonville, and while some of them are dying, some of them are sick, there are thousands of healthy soldiers there. In the week after the capture of Atlanta, the Confederacy moves 17,000 prisoners from Andersonville. And this, this highlights an important point that's often lost. We say, oh, the South couldn't feed their own. <laughs> it's not about what they have and don't have. It's how they choose to use it. They have massive amounts of food. Andersonville in August of 1864 is a very hungry place. A million pounds of food is being consumed just by prisoners, not by the Confederate staff. It's a very hungry place. To supply the prison hospital, the, the command at Andersonville approaches the Governor Brown of Georgia and says, you have tents. The Georgia Reserve has a surplus of tents. We would like to have these to to adequately house the prisoners in Andersonville. What does the governor of Georgia say? No. And he's not alone. It's it's a matter of choice. And the best illustration of that is a week after Atlanta is captured, 17,000 men are moved in seven days. That's, That's... hundred trains. It's a massive logistical effort. 
And they do that because they are afraid. United States military prisons you know, fall into two broad categories of facility. The first, and in many respects the most famous, are the training camps. Places like Elmira, or Camp Douglas, or Camp Morton, or Camp Randall, that it began as training camps and then are switched either partially or fully over to military prisons. They were not perfect facilities. They're, they weren't intended to barrack prisoners year round. That they have to be adapted to that purpose. These are the sites that today, with few exceptions, either do not exist at all or only <coughs> barely exist. Camp Randall is sort of the best example in that not only is it the stadium, there is part of the barrack structure still surviving. The other class of US military prison, and this is the one that's most overlooked, are the coastal fortifications. Another you know, off, very common question or observation at Andersonville is this idea that, well, Andersonville is the only one that's preserved. No, it's not. In the national park system alone, there are a dozen Civil War military prisons. Charitably saying that Richmond includes Belle Isle. They talk about it, but the, the property is not National Park Service property. <coughs> 10 of 12 are federal military prisons, including Castle Williams on Governor's Island. You had four military forts in the New York Harbor as military prisons. Fort McHenry in Baltimore is a military prison, and Francis Scott Key's grandson is held at Fort McHenry. The irony of that was not lost on him. <laughs> the, these coastal forts, um, most of them still survive. They, they, they are testimony, you know, as historic sites, with the, with the exception of the Governor's Island sites, they're not that, being a military prison is a blip in their radar of history. You know, they, it's only a tiny part of their story. The, the best example in, of the, this history hidden in plain sight, you know, the fact that it's sort of everywhere, three of the four New York Harbor forts survive. Two of them are on Governor's Island. The other one, you've seen it. We've all seen it but you don't recognize it as a military prison. Statue, but written. Fort Wood on Bedloe's Island, which in the 1880s was filled in and turned into the base of the Statue of Liberty. And think about that for a minute. Georgia soldiers were held and died in Fort Wood. Today they're in the Woodlawn National Cemetery. And our, in Andersonville, you know, working at Andersonville, we, you, you have to in front of the public, you know, have, have a very even tone about the stories you're telling. Behind closed doors, that's when you let out the gallows humor a little bit. And so our internal name for the Statue of Liberty is the Statue of Captivity. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's funny, but it's also, it belies an irony. This m incredible icon of liberty is built on top of a place where we held each other prisoner. And if you look real hard on Liberty Island, there's at least one plaque that sort of addresses that. And, but people who go to see the Statue of Liberty, they don't, they're not, sadly, they're not going there for its civil war history. I wish they would. <laughs> Confederate military prison facilities fall into two broad categories. The stuff around Richmond that are built, you know, buildings, tobacco warehouses, or warehouse structures in downtown Richmond, and then the stockade pens, like Camp Sumter and Camp Lawton. And, and Belle Isle is a really good example of, of this, because it's sort of the prototype of what would come later on four acres. In the course of the war, Belle Isle sees a, a prison population, total prison population, that rivals Andersonville. I mean, it's massive. There's never, and it's four acres in size, so they don't have 40,000 people there at once. Okay. 
to step away from the big picture, the one way that you can sort of even the playing field with an asterisk is by looking at the prisoner of war experience on an individual level. The emotional experience of being captured, having your, your rifle taken from you, having your rights taken away from you, and your freedoms taken away from you, that emotional experience is the same if it's Virginia in 1964, <coughs> Atlanta, Georgia in 1864, Europe in, in 1944, or Vietnam in 1966. You, you're, that emotional journey is identical. The circumstances often are very difficult, but you know, that, that emotional journey is, is identical. And it starts with capture, where you go from you know, a soldier, sort of an equal on a battlefield, to someone who is not an equal. And this is an important, something we often forget today, you know, how we look at prisoners of war now in America is radically different than how we did even two generations ago. Until you know, post-Vietnam years, Prisoners of war were something we didn't like to talk about because those men were failures. They were broken soldiers. They were cowards. So if you're a prisoner, how do you feel about what happened to you? Is it your fault that you got captured? At the time, it was. Culturally, that's how we felt about it. And, and so prisoner memoirs, when they're writing about their capture experience, you know, when, they, and when you read the whole memoir, they are hyper-detailed in, in the circumstances of their capture to prove to you, the reader, and to themselves that they didn't fail, that circumstances conspired against them to make them captives. From the battlefield is a journey to that uncertain future to, to a prison or prisons. We, train transportation is the primary mode of, of transporting prisoners from, from place to place. I mean, and we can't, and that's north and south. We, it's really important to talk about that. If you're captured in the Overland Campaign in Virginia, it's eight days in the summer to Andersonville. They're letting you off the train once a day to eat. That's a pretty brutal journey. They're packing you generally 60 to 75 into a cattle car. The, the other, the footnote to this, you know, although it isn't, that this train transportation is also the weakest part of your captivity. If you attempt escape during transport, you are much more likely to succeed. And we tend to think of these prisoners as prisoners in one place. They tend to be prisoners you know, with few exceptions. You're, you're held in as many as three prisons. It, especially if you're a federal prisoner held in the Confederacy in 1863 or four, at least three generally speaking. It was a trivia question. If by, by the fall of 1864, both sides, you know, the U.S. is doing it much earlier, beginning at Camp Douglas here in Chicago, going into these prisons and saying, hey, we've got the get-out-of-jail-free card. <laughs> Join our side. You know, sign, sign the loyalty oath and and you, so you have Illinois regiments that include Tennessee men who've been captured at Donaldson. Men who, in some of these cases, these are men that end up switching sides two or three times. <laughs> and the flip side of that, of course, is in the fall of 1864 in the Confederacy, this is a real test of your loyalty to your country, to the cause. Things are desperate. You're watching your friends die, and here they say, you know, Colonel O'Neill of the 10th Tennessee, I'm here, we, you, you can leave tomorrow. Do you do it? 
And here's another disconnect in how prisoners remembered this. In memoirs, survivors always lowball the number of men that, that take the oath. And both sides use the term galvanized Yankee. Both sides do. And Andersonville is pretty small, and, and largely that's because by the fall of 1864, Andersonville is a virtual ghost town with less than a couple thousand prisoners. At Camp Lawton, across the state of Georgia, you know, that prison operates for six weeks only, and they, about a thousand men take the oath there, out of a population of 11,000. It's, it's that you know, calculated risk as a prisoner of war. You know, you're, they have a different you know, moral arithmetic that really distills down to, what can I do to live? Prisoner, prisoners often describe a landscape, this landscape of, their, you know, of the prisons, the, the places they're held, and they struggle trying to quantify, trying to describe each of these facilities separately. Prisoner George Tibbles, you know, after the war, he, in front of Congress, you know, he says this, no one can imagine the agony of continued hunger unless he has experienced it. I've felt it, witnessed it, yet I cannot find the language to adequately describe it. The stockade wall is a defining characteristic, and, and prisoners, especially those who are prison artists, like Robert Knox Sneedon or Thomas O'Day, their art is hyper-accurate to the interior of the prison, the, the place where they're being held. The moment they try to make a map or describe the exterior of the prison, spatial relationships, where things are or the size of things, are, are out of whack. And <clears throat> Sneedon's drawings of the compounds at Andersonville and at Camp Lawton are especially illustrative of this fact the earthworks that surround the prison. And again, you know, where are the guns pointed at Andersonville? They're not pointed out for defense. They're pointed in for control. Those earthworks in Sneedon's maps, they're on steroids. They're the Arnold Schwarzenegger of Civil War earthworks. They're massive. That's because he saw them from a distance, and they appeared big to him. He, ne he didn't get the grand tour of the place. <laughs> So prisoners really can only, you know, they can only accurately describe what they see immediately. And that often you know, really flavors what, you know, their depictions afterward. Prisoners face impossible choices. Galvanizing is just one part of this. The, a Michigan soldier by the name of John Tarsney had been in Andersonville, he's moved in the fall to Camp Lawton, and the very first movement toward reestablishing exchanges occurs late in 1864. It's a limited exchange of the very sick, and John Tarsney's not among those men, he's pretty healthy. And the night before the exchange, as he's walking through the, the compound at Camp Lawton, he sees a fellow prisoner who's clearly not well. And he makes a choice. He could ignore the guy. He goes over and talks to him, gets his name, gets his regiment, where he was captured, what prison squad he's assigned to. And on the one hand, this is a, an incredible act of mercy. He's spending time with a dying man. He has, he has a motive. <laughs> the next morning, before the exchange, you know, before the parolees are supposed to report, that prisoner is dead. John Tarr's name, it's an impossible choice. He puts his own name on a piece of paper and puts it on the dead man's body. And he assumes that name. So he literally kills himself to live. He's very fortunate that record keeping at Camp Lawton is so bad that <laughs> None of the 700 men who die there are identified. And so after the war, he, he 
reclaims his, his own identity. When he's reporting for that exchange, the sergeant of the squad knows he's not the guy. And Tarzani has to pay off a fellow prisoner, a gold watch, to get through. We know this story because John Tarzani goes on to become a congressman from Missouri in the 1890s. And in a fabulous article about congressmen who were prisoners of war, he, he recounts his escape from Andersonville. And, and that, that highlights something that was a question yesterday in Milwaukee you know, about escapes. Most of the escapes from Andersonville are just like John Tarr's name. Nope. <laughs> he wasn't at Andersonville. He did, however, find his way to freedom. And after the war, survivors are left with this struggle to, to make sense of their experience. This, this is a detail from a very early print depicting Andersonville, published in 1866 here in Chicago by the Andersonville Survivors Association. The, and this is a marvelous piece of work. The, 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 the artist, the, the head of that or Andersonville Survivors Association is a survivor by the name of Felix de la Bohm. He's one of the more notorious minor characters of the Wurtz trial, and what you're seeing here are scenes from testimony in the Wurtz trial. If Andersonville was an enlisted prison, there are no celebrities there. The closest you come is this prisoner right here. That depicts Boston Corbett. <laughs> and Boston Corbett it was famous among the population at Andersonville as as a preacher, a lay minister in the camp meetings at the site. And, and that, you know, he, he testifies in the trial as well. You'll notice, of course, here, well, here's an actual man in the cloth, you know, one of the Catholic priests that enters the prison. The other scenes are literally all out of testimony in the trial. Prison experiences remain an open wound. In the, in the generations after the war, prisoners defend their experience as something important. And that speeds up considerably you know, after 1876 when Southerners start to deflect blame for Andersonville to, to either the victims or to the United States, say, it's not our fault, it's your fault. And that speeds up even further in the early 20th century with the establishment of a monument by the United Daughters of the Confederacy in 1909 at, at Andersonville. Not at the prison site itself, but a mile away in the town of Andersonville is a monument that makes a man who oversaw the deaths of 13,000 American soldiers into a victim. The most extraordinary thing about Civil War prison survivors is how ordinary their lives are after the war. A few of them become sort of professional survivors, but most of these men, they're farmers, they're teachers, they're businessmen. This thing they experience stays with them, but it does not define their lives. So how do we make sense of it? And the irony here, ultimately, is prisoners themselves did come, you know, they, they generally make a peace with what happened to them. You know, they, they don't always forgive, like you see there you know, earlier. Corporal John January, Company B of the 14th Illinois, was captured in, in the Stoneman's Raid south of Atlanta in July of 1864. Stoneman's Raiders, when they arrived at Andersonville, they're the fruition of the Confederacy's worst nightmare, the U.S. Army coming to liberate the prison. The enlisted men of Stoneman's Raid are brutally treated. They are stripped. They are, they are brutalized because they represent the greatest fear of the, of the prison. January survives Andersonville just fine. He's moved in the fall to Florence, South Carolina. And at Florence, 
courtesy the the food of of the military prison, he contracts scurvy to the point that you know, when he reports to the prison hospital, the Confederate surgeon looks at him and says the equivalent in 1864 terms of "You're going to die, kid. Good luck." What do you do to save your own life? John January goes back into the main compound and with the help of his friends amputates his own feet to live. When we think about Andersonville survivors, the common, common image in our head are, are the photographs that I like to call the scarecrows. Most of the, there's about 14 or so of those images only two of them are Andersonville survivors. Every single other one of those pictures of those starving men are men that were exchanged from Belle Isle when Andersonville is one month old. This, this is the true image of someone who's lived, lived through Andersonville. He survived at a great cost. And he lives a, a remarkably long life. In, a con in the Congressional investigation on the treatment of prisoners of war by rebel authorities in 1868 and 69, John January writes a letter to the committee in which he declares this. I went from home full of hope, with an ardent desire to do something for my country. Flushed with health and strength, I came home worn down with nothing to comfort me, only the thought that I have tried to do my duty, and that my sufferings were for a good cause. And I thank you this evening. Oh, absolutely. I, I like to talk. And, and again, this is, you know, this is the 60 mile an hour version of the big story. Yes, sir. Why wasn't somebody like Wanger uh, tried and executed? Yeah. What a great question. And here's why. Wanger was no longer available. <laughs> he is, he's the unsung villain of the story in many respects. Yeah. He's masterminding yeah. how these prisons operate. He, in the trial, it's very clear that the dysfunctional command structure of Andersonville, in which the reserve, Georgia Reserve officers who are commanding the guard force, they're stationed there for six months. And these captains, these officers, do they go to the stockade? No, they don't have to. It's compartmentalized. In February of 1865, Winder has a heart attack and dies. While inspecting another one of the prisons in the Carolinas, Mary Chestnut, in her diary, you know, her husband attends that funeral, and she literally notes, they say he was saved the noose. <laughs> they kind of know what's coming. <laughs> the, the commander at Salisbury, North Carolina, is also tried by a military tribunal after Henry Wirtz, and it's really significant to note that Major John Gee is acquitted. And that's what does he do different? He treats prisoners like they're human beings. He, he's operating under the same constraints in terms of supply and you know, supply chain. But, and there, there, you had New York Tribune writers, journalists, civilians being held at Salisbury who witnessed the transformation of Salisbury from an unremarkable prison to a pretty unpleasant place. And, one of these reporters is working in the hospital, writing down names of people who die. <coughs> but Major B is, is clearly able in his defense to say, you know, I did my, within, within you know, the, the things I could do, I did my best. So, but Winder is no longer available, as they. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, one of the accusations against Henry Wirtz was that uh, some of the Southern women uh, were going to try to present some food for mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, prisoners, but the uh, but uh, Wirtz rejected uh, that. Well, and this ties back to the other question: in that it's not just Wirtz. This is a this story is 
they spend an awful lot of time talking about this in the course of the trial. You know, the, these are Methodist church women from America's Georgia. They make two or three successful trips. Oh, each time bringing a few more supplies you know, bound for the prison hospital. There's two different hospitals at Camp Sumter. There's the prison hospital compound, and then there's the Confederate hospital. On this final trip, you know, each time they go, they have more stuff. And on this final trip, Lieutenant Davis, who's one of Words' his subordinates, you know, queries them, hey, you know, he sees the past they have from General Winder, and he says, well, where, where are you taking this stuff again? And you have this sort of comedy of errors. One of the husbands takes a pass <coughs> to General Winder's office and says, General, you, you've given us permission to be here. And, and, it, and there's my alarm telling me I'm done. The, <laughs> Winder, perhaps for the first time, understands the nature of the mercy these people were bringing. To the Confederate command staff, who needs help? The Confederate guards, the Confederate sick. And you have this big conference. You know, the, the husband who's in General Wider's office at a certain point realizes that not only are they about to be in a lot of trouble, that their very lives may be at risk. And so he backs out and he goes back to the ladies and says, We need to leave. And by that time, you then have Lieutenant Davis. General Winder and Henry Wirtz, and Wirtz calls these women prostitutes, which is a pretty severe accusation in 1864 in front of their husbands. And Winder, damn your, you know, damn your mercy mission. God damn you. And the, the, the Methodist ladies leave. They abandon their wagon and their relief supplies, and those supplies are not given to prisoners. They're, they're given to where the perceived need is, the Confederate Guard staff. And again, that, that was a choice that, that the command staff made. Yes, sir? Uh, some Southern accounts say that the, uh, the claim, at least, yeah. that the prison guards at Andersonville were almost as bad off for food and supplies as the prisoners themselves. Could you comment on that? No. And here's the best example of that. So in the course of the prison's operation, you know, the guard force starts out as regular, you know, Alabama and Georgia infantry units. They move off in May back to where they're needed to fight the war, and they're replaced by Georgia reserves. <coughs> the Conscription Act has been widely given in Georgia. It, by early 1864, and so you have teenagers and then men in their 50s and 60s as guards. In the, in, so five, six, somewhere in the vicinity of about 5,000 guards in 14 months, you know, guard force, 200 deaths. That's like 4%. That makes, it's one of the lowest death rates of a Confederate facility in the entire war. It's not pleasant work. But to say guards are you know, under the same circumstances, the same constrictions as prisoners, is, is a pretty remarkable lie. Because they're not. They're free. They can leave. They can get extra food. They're not the same. You know, it's, it's a pretty miserable place. and You could smell it two miles away. But you know, the guard force is not even a bit the same. Now, what's remarkable about the guard force is, is that some of these men recognize that what's happening around them is wrong. A, a Georgia Reserve private by the name of James Anderson writes Jefferson Davis in late June saying, you know, if you knew what was happening here, you'd stop it. You're a Christian man. If you send an officer here, he will circulate among the officers and be told all is well. If you send a common man, he will circulate among the privates and you'll get the truth of the matter. Please do not forward this letter to my superiors, for I'm afraid I will be punished. Yeah. P.S. Excuse pencil. 
<laughs> Two weeks later, in early July, Private Anderson is transferred to railroad passport duty. And I like to think that he followed his conscience and got away from what he, he, what he describes in this letter is guards shooting prisoners who are not, have not crossed the deadline and then being told by the NCOs, good job, keep doing that. Private Anderson follows his conscience. He moves away. Now, in late July, that letter makes it to the Jefferson Davis's office, and it's, what happens to it? It's forwarded to the Secretary of War. What does the Secretary of War do with it? Forward it to General Winder. Uh -oh. And on Private Anderson's service record, there's a notation at the bottom that's not dated. Furlough by order of General Winder. Winder got rid of it because he wasn't committed to the cause. And Andersonville is a place where mercy becomes treason. You, there are also in the Wirtz trial descriptions of Wirtz ordering sergeants, punish them like this, do it like this, make them do this, and then walking away, and the sergeant kind of looks at the squad of prisoners and says, eh, you know, keep going. His leadership, he's so strong in personality, you know, these sergeants are not following his command, or the letter of his command. Oh, I saw that hand first. Yes. About 50 years ago, a play was written called The Andersonville Trial. Yes. And it was later, of course, turned into a made for TV movie that ran on what was about to become public television. How accurate was it? It's, it's not as accurate as Cantor's novel. And it's highly compressed. And you know, Saul Levitt, the playwright, the House of American Activities Committee investigates him at the request of a Georgia <laughs> congressman whose father was a guard in Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty accurate. They, he, Saul Levitt uses the trial transcript, you know, the 800 page transcript, but it's not so. It's not really intended to be a documentary as much as it is a meditation on what is justice. And Levitt really had Nuremberg in mind. You know, and, and there's there's amazing timing. You know, modern history intersected with that play in, in terms of the television promo promotion because the My Lai massacre becomes a public public knowledge the month before it airs. And PBS in its nascent form do something very, very brave. They they changed their entire promotion for the Andersonville trial teleplay with starring William Shatner. <laughs> and they connect the dots. They say this equals that, which is really brave and a little. It's all allegory, but you know, it's it's a good piece. I I I, I certainly appreciate it myself. And then okay, I saw well. It, it sounds like Frank, 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 which deals with prisoners' hope yeah, and the effect on the way POWs were perceived. We, there's not a lot of reference to, to, to music beyond religious music inside, inside the prison during its operation. It, it serves a role in that it, it, it does, again, there's this tension of being a prisoner is not part of the heroic narrative of the war, and yet, you know, that it is. It's it's part of the war story. And you know, we were talking earlier this evening. At one point, the GAR's induction ceremony, as you became a member, part of that ceremony, that initiation, you said the name, you took on the name of a U.S. soldier who died at Anderson. So the GAR itself, you know, veterans, survivors, who may not have ever seen a prison, they're holding that story very closely. There there's even a song specifically about Andersonville that the Library of Congress has the sheet music to. I, I don't think they play really, other than you know, Prisoner's Hope is probably the closest you come to a mainstream hit. Yes? Um, in the town of Sumter, they have a monument mm -hmm. uh, to Henry Wurtz and the, the uh, 
uh, Confederate loyalists uh, made a martyr out of uh, yes. the works. Yeah, and that, the, the works monument you know, is a reaction. You have monuments built at the prison site in the National Cemetery between 1899 and 1916. So right about, not quite the halfway point of that, by 19, 1905 is when the, the Wisconsin Monument is dedicated. The Illinois Monument is a little bit more ill-fated. It, it isn't dedicated until 1912. Southern ladies, the UDC, become pretty incensed about these monuments. And, and it's not about the monument itself, it's about really about the dedication ceremonies, because the, the ceremonies follow a pattern in which the first speaker says, we're all a reunited country, everything's great today, and then the next speaker is a survivor who says, it's all the South's fault, they tried to kill us. <laughs> and, and, and over and over again, with the notable exception, the when the Rhode Island Monument is dedicated in 1904, every single speech is, is pacifist. You know, they are anti-war speeches that you know, are, are very anomalous. In the three years that the Words Monument takes to go from an idea to a dedicated thing, it's national news. Every time progress is made or every time the GAR meets, it's national news. The GAR is tearing out their hair because they, they don't want it to happen. They, re they recognize that I don't think they fully appreciate the, full, the extent to which the Wurtz Monument literally changes history. They know it's coming and they, they, they're fighting against the tide, but the Wurtz Monument was very, very successful. It, it's not without its Risks, though, you know, it's dedicated in April of 1909. One month later, for Memorial Day, you know, Sumter County has to call out the militia oh. to protect the monument. Because who's celebrating Memorial Day in Andersonville? <coughs> Thousands of African Americans. <coughs> and they're afraid, the white supremacist majority is afraid that those, those uppity folks are going to destroy that monument. And you fast forward another decade, or not quite a decade, there's a Souther Field, one of the oldest op operate, continuously operating airfields in America. It's, it's an Air Corps training base during World War I, and young men one night leave Souther Field, sneak to Andersonville, and they, they pour paint, the colors of the German flag on the monument. And, and it, it's during the same time period, about 1917 was the last time a professional, you know, a subject matter expert wrote a, a book length treatise on the Wurtz trial. When we talk about Henry Wurtz, we do so in a vacuum because most historians stay the hell away from the story because, again, you know, I work, worked at, I worked at Western history sites. I, it's what I call, like to call the Liberty Balance Principle. When the legend oh. is better than the truth, you go with the legend. It's really, pushing that rock uphill is really hard. And you know, fighting against these mythic moments is really hard. And you know, the flip side of that, and you know, my colleagues at Andersonville are, you know, are dealing with another one. You know, it's a perennial thing. You get someone who wants to write on Henry Wirtz, they're writing the same damn thing that's been written for a hundred years, which is, oh, poor guy, he's a scapegoat. 13,000 Americans were dead. If you excuse him, who do you hold responsible? Had Winder lived, Winder would have been yeah. put to death. Absolutely, I don't doubt that. But yeah, the, the Wurtz Monument, now, to leave on a, on a high note, you know, my mother always taught me if you can't say something nice, you can't say anything at all. Here's the other thought I'd leave you with the Wurtz Monument. I think it's weird. It's really strange. And yet, it's a testament to a free society. In a free society, there's more than one way to tell a story. And it's, it's what I like to call the right to be wrong. <laughs> and there it is. Oh, oh, your turn. Could I have just one more question about yeah. this man here? Yeah. 
How was it that cutting off his feet improved his chances to live? Well, you know, I wasn't there. He's, <laughs> but he's desperate enough that he did that. You know, you, when you get scurvy severe enough, it constricts, you know, it, it's, it's going to lead to gangrene and other issues. The part of his legend is he does that by himself. No, he doesn't. He had that. he had friends. He had help. There's this is one of a series of photographs. There's portraits of him, you know, with the top hat and everything standing up. There's another version of this photograph in which the prosthetics are on either side. Oh, yes. I hate to monopolize the question. Oh, please. please. One other thing. Uh, I'd like for you to talk about the uniqueness of the visitor center at the Andersonville. Well, it's not just the visitor center, it's the whole approach to the place. In Andersonville, the cemetery is managed by the U.S. Army for over a century, from 1865 to 1971. The prison park is saved from destruction by survivors by the GAR, the Georgia Department, in, in 1890. In 1896, they turn it over to the Women's Relief Corps, the auxiliary, to manage and preserve the site. The late, so you have New England ladies living on the prison site. They, they build a, a caretaker's lodge, two-story structure with, with rooms decorated by survivors. By 1910, the Women's Relief Corps is aging out, and so these these women can't take care of it anymore, and they, so they, the law is passed, and the property is transferred to the War Department, and so the Army then becomes the caretaker of both. By the 1920s, most of the survivors are gone, so Andersonville becomes pretty easy duty for an Army superintendent. Between 1870 and 1939, the space of 69 years, there are only 50 burials at Andersonville. Again, if you're white and you're from South Georgia, you do not want to be buried with the damn Yankees. It's a really quiet place. Then World War II happens, and all of a sudden that cemetery picks back up. It remains a functional, active national cemetery. And then McKinley Cantor's book gets published, and the army is burdened by tourists. <laughs> they don't want to do that. And and then you get through the, the Civil War Centennial, and as a measure of two things, divisive racial politics in South Georgia, and then the Army's unwillingness to really do anything, nothing happens at Andersonville for the Centennial. But things are about to happen. The, at the behest of State Senator Jimmy Carter, <coughs> A movement begins to, to do something in Andersonville. A he, he commissions the University of Georgia to do a study that one of its one of its suggestions is make it a national park site. And that that law is passed in October of 1970. And to burst the bubble on national parks, parks are politics. Congress has to create them, and you know, there's a political process. Andersonville, and and when we preserve the past, how we how we choose to do so is often influenced by the present. And in 1970, prisoners of war were not a quaint part of our past; they were part of our present, courtesy of the war in Vietnam. And and so it's it's half a sentence in the in the Parks Enabling Legislation that says, "Serve as a memorial to prisoners of war throughout American history." For the first 25 years of the park's history. Nothing really was done with that. But in the 1980s, World War II POWs realized that Andersonville could be a place where their story could be told. They realized that their experience was like his. And, and it's through their work that a $14 million visitor center branded the National Prisoner of War Museum was opened in 1998. And that exhibit explores the experience of captivity and its component parts. And so in the exhibits, you'll have a soldier's housewife used by a prisoner at Andersonville, and in the shelf below it, a sewing kit, all, you know, almost identical, used 90 years later in Korea by an American soldier. In the opposite exhibit panel, a wooden canteen, 
bearing the inscription, Camp Sumter, Georgia, 1864, names, and then below it, U.S. Army and Navy mess kits from the Pacific Theater, inscribed with names and naval scenes. And the genius of that is what happens to these men is not a, it's not a one-off part of our history. Every time we go to war, Americans are captives. Americans take captives. And one of the real, something the Park Service is only now, so in 1970, Congress created a postmodern national park without knowing they, they were doing that. <laughs> one of the things that, quite frankly, especially the smaller Civil War national park sites struggle with is what I call the so what question. So what? I mean, you guys, you, you're, you're not the audience they need to win over. The audience they need to win over are 12 year olds. Mm -hmm. So what? And in Andersonville, people get it. And through the presentation of connecting it to John McCain, connecting it to Jessica Lynch, we, we, we were talking about Bo Bergdahl at a time when nobody else was mm -hmm. at Andersonville. And, and, and his story, which is, is still quite frankly not over, you know, harkens back to the, how prisoners were treated after Korea. And, and that national park sites and historical sites should be places where you can have a conversation. And the Prisoner of War Museum is a remarkable thing that not near enough people know about. So thank you for letting me shill. <laughs> Thank you.